Good evening, and welcome to our very first episode of Love and Respect. I'm Michael Render. I'm thrilled to be here on Revolt TV, coming to you from the city I call home, Atlanta, Georgia. Tonight, I'm honored to kick off our first show with the mayor of this great city, Keisha Lance Bottoms. Mayor Bottoms, tonight, on her time in office, her decision not to run for re-election, and her plans for the future. Thanks for joining us, Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, coming up right now. Welcome to Love and Respect. Um, the Honorable Keisha Lance Bottoms, our current mayor, I think one of our most dynamic mayors. Thank you for being the first guest on my show. Thank you for having me yeah. as the first guest yeah. on your show. This is incredible. I'm so happy for you. I appreciate you. I want to ask this question quick because I got to lay out the groundwork for who you are before and beyond mayor. All right. So you are a 60th mayor, right? I am. 60th mayor, second female mayor, 70% approval rating, well-funded. Why not run again? You know, I wish I had a single answer for that because it would have been easier for me and mm -hmm. it would be easier to convey to people like you, my, my friends and my family, but it really was not anything, one single thing. And, yeah. you know, you are seeing these articles about the great resignation. Mm -hmm. So I know, um, like, the rest of the universe, we've all been reevaluating yeah. over the past almost two years now. And for me, uh, it really was very personal in that my dad died suddenly when he was 55. Yeah. So being over 50, you just start doing that soul searching on how you want to spend your days. Yeah. And if uh, these were my last days on earth, yeah. how would I want to spend them? And, and I love my job. It's yeah. been my highest honor to be the mayor of Atlanta, but there's so much more. Yeah. And I wanted to take the opportunity to explore more. So voters get to decide yeah. every four years, and so do candidates. I, I tell you this, um, what the last 20 months have taught me is my job I love, right? I, I love singing and dancing and get paid a lot of money for it. But I have a child that's mm -hmm. on dialysis. I have, um, who we're waiting, kidney transplant, go Pony Boy. I have two boys, two girls, and I realized that I had spent most of their life chasing my dream or accomplishing my goal. Now, I was their dad. They weren't secondary, but they definitely a lot of times were in league with whatever I was in league with and doing. And this last 20 months allowed me to reset and say, well, I'm only going to do five shows this year. I'm not going to try to do mm -hmm. more. I'm not, I'm not going to. So I definitely identify with you on that. And I can, that's probably one of the mm -hmm. best answers I've heard of all the speculation that, man, I never realized your dad died so young. And when you do, yeah. When you get over 40, I would say you start thinking about your mentality different. So thank you for it. Now I understand. I really get it. And you yeah. talk about your children and your husband often. And um, it, you're, you're, besides being a mayor, you're a heck of a mom and a wife, it seems. So I would imagine they're happy. They're going to have you a lot more around home, I would imagine. Well, two of my four kids are happy. Yeah. I mean, they, they were split, <laughs> you know, like the electorate. Two of the four. Two were like, what now? Yeah. What are you thinking? And the other two just wanted me to be happy, but that kind of aligns yeah, with I their personality. That's kind of like at home, too. So we're from a place called the Collier Heights, mm -hmm. um, Collier Heights Adamsville community. It's a, and, it, and that's special because in 1948, a group of black folks decided, you know what, we don't want to argue with you. We don't want to fight for busting integration. We want our rights. We want equal rights, one of those things. But we're going to carve out a piece of the West Atlanta for ourselves. Mm -hmm. They carved out this beautiful community that had everything from working class family, like your parents and my grandparents, to state representatives, Cynthia and Billy McKinney, Dr. King's parents lived there, yeah. Herman Russell lived there. So it really was the mixed income. Our whole totality was black. What was it like growing up a young African American woman in that community, in that time, and did it do something for your confidence? Did it give you something that's helped propel you to who you are? And what was that like so people get to know you beyond the mayor? Well, right across the street from me, directly across the street, was Coach McAfee, yeah. who's the coach of the Morehouse basketball team. So you're right. There was just this incredible presence around us at all times. And I remember going to the grocery store, um, seeing a white woman in the grocery store, and we had just moved from... Um, 
we had just moved back from England. Mm -hmm. And I remember asking my dad, how did that white lady get here? Because I thought all white people live <laughs> in England, and I thought all black people live in Atlanta. <laughs> um, and so I, re I remember that moment of being aware that we weren't just an all African-American community. Mm -hmm. But the beauty of it was we believed we could do anything. Yeah. Because there were people around us doing everything. everything. And... Um, it has everything to do with who I am today. I mean, when you instill that type of confidence in children and you're offering children the best education, not the best education for black kids, but the absolute best education. I remember when Douglas High School was awarded the National School of Excellence. Excellence. You would have thought we had won the World Series. Yeah. I mean, it was such a big deal, but... Um, you know, that, that confidence and that love and just that inspiration just to have this community of people cheering you on yeah. and slapping you on the hand or yeah. with Mr. Hill's case, our assistant principal yeah. throwing some keys this big at you yeah. uh, when you did wrong. I think it, it's the reason you are who you are yeah. and it's the reason I got to be the mayor. Absolutely. I believed I could be the mayor. You're not honoring the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. and the civil rights movement. You're not protesting anything running out with brown liquor in your hands, breaking windows in this city. Atlanta is a place uh, where we can set an example of prosperity, and we've done that for generations. People like Doc, Dr. King, uh, uh, Maynard Jackson, Ambassador Young have paved the way for us. It is your duty not to burn your own house down for anger with an enemy. Now is the time to plot, plan, strategize, organize, and mobilize. I think what we showed in that moment was that Atlantans, black and white and otherwise, can come together and do what's right for this small town growing into a big city. I had to chuckle because I remember uh, talking to my team saying, we got to get some people down here. Yeah. because we were seeing something we had never seen before in the city. Yeah. And I was thinking about my 19-year-old, yeah. or who was then 18, and I knew he, he wasn't going, he didn't listen to me on a good day. Yeah. Um, so I thought, well, who will our kids yeah. listen to? And um, they said, well, we talked to T.I., but Killer Mike said he ain't coming. <laughs> 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 I was like, what now? <laughs> um, and of course you came. Yeah. And, you know, in, in that moment, I probably learned more about leadership in that hour than I learned my entire life. The cops um, were ready to go in earlier, and yeah. I knew it was real, and I knew I was looking at Keisha Lance, not just yeah. the Honorable Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. When I saw you turn and tell the cops, stop wait and you weren't you were yelling and and not yelling at them but you were yelling that i'm the authority in this room we will not blindly send them into there until these people have had a chance to speak and i've always wanted to congratulate you and, and let the public know that because oftentimes it feels as though the political class and the and the, and the cop class is in collusion against the the, the, the constituents of the proletariat and i saw you in that moment stave off the police to say hold on we're going to let logic have an opportunity to prevail. So I just got to say thank you for that. And this is a son of a police officer, cousins of police officers. So I know cops a lot of times, they ain't, they ain't, they, they want to go ahead and get it done. After I spoke, yeah. and I looked at you and T.I., yeah. <laughs> and I said, I don't know, like, y'all got something to say. <laughs> and you both stopped, and you were like, and, and then you came up and gave probably one of the most impactful speeches of the last 50 years in that moment. And it was so heartfelt. And when I asked for for us to go before the cameras, I thought, the kids may not listen, but if their parents are listening, yeah. they'll call and say, where are you? Yeah. Come, come home, yeah. stop. Yeah. Because we knew, and you know this, because you were a mentee of Reverend Orange. Absolutely. It's about planning and it's, you know, yeah. you, you look at the civil rights movement, they would plan to go Absolutely. and then they would say, not today, today is not the day. Absolutely. And that day in our city was not. Yeah. 
the day. Yeah. So I, th I thank you for coming. Absolutely. And I, uh, I got to thank Tip for <laughs> nudging you to come. Yeah. You did something very brave in a moratorium on building. You realized that right on the west side of Atlanta, that much like in other cities, if you look at what happened in San Francisco and poor people being pushed out, if you look like even places that are progressive, like Austin, as richer people are able to move in, it's pushing working class people out. You said that the legacy residents that are in places like Center Hill, Grove Park, Adamsville, mm -hmm. Carter Heights, they need an opportunity to, to catch up, to pay their taxes. Their children, their grandchildren need an opportunity to keep their properties. You said very bravely, don't sell your parents' houses. Yeah. You said that as a mayor. That's home for me. So I, I can't tell you how many Saturdays I spent standing in line at Bankhead Seafood yeah. with the orders from the hair yeah. salon <laughs> because they were only open Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Yeah. And uh, for the first time, I cried during a check presentation. We were at Carter G. Woodson mm -hmm. uh, Elementary School, or what used to be the elementary school, just a couple of weeks ago. And a, a grant was given to the Grove Park community. Yeah. And, you know, again, it's, I'm not making these decisions from afar. This is not mm -hmm. my team yeah. telling me about it. I, I know these places. Yeah. Um, and I'm sorry I've cost you a tip. It sounds like a few million dollars. I, I think we're back year. on the path now. I think it's <laughs> but it, and, and again, I appreciate everything that you all are doing for the West Side because the other side of that, you're opening up, reopening this yes. business. Yes. Tip's doing affordable housing yes. on the West Side. Yes. And, and you talk about how you show up every day. Well, my grandmother used to ride the bus every day to Lenox Mall from her home on Lenox Square Mall. Right. Um, her home off of ML King, yeah. and we get that 20% discount at Davison's and then yeah. Macy's, and um, my dad used to always say, no matter how bad your day is, you better always show up looking like everything is okay. That's right. So I think that that's what you get from us when we show up in our communities. But again, it, the, the redevelopment of Atlanta in and of itself is not a bad thing. The bad thing is when our communities get left behind. Very quickly though, this doesn't have to be fast, but the All-Star Game. We lost the All-Star Game. Mm -hmm. I felt like that was one of those times where we let national politics decide what we did locally, and I thought mm -hmm. that was a big mistake. We probably lost about $40 million in terms yeah. of losing the All-Star Game. It didn't feel very good to me. And I felt like, you know, some people didn't say, man, we should have thought about that a little longer before we called for boycotts in Atlanta yeah. and in Georgia. Because in losing the All-Star game, I felt snubbed by the MLB because they took it not to St. Louis, not to where the Negro League Hall of Fame is or any place like that. They took it to Colorado. How important is it that the mayor of Atlanta understand the balance of wanting civil rights, wanting equity, and good business? My good friend, Michael Hancock, is actually mayor of Denver, so I was, I was happy that if it were going somewhere... I was that, not that, Michael. That, I was not Michael, happy for Michael um, at all. Now. Michael got a chance to own it, but I, ironically, I just had a conversation last week at the Braves game with the MLB commissioner, mm -hmm. and what I shared with him is that um, I appreciated the, the thought behind supporting our state, but I personally did not like the boycott of our state, um, a couple of reasons. My husband works for a corporation. Yeah. And there are many people whose families are fed, whether it be because your husband or your, your wife is an executive or if there's somebody who's coming in cleaning up at night. Yeah. Um, so we have roughly, I, I think we're number three in terms of Fortune 500 companies yeah. headquartered in Atlanta, um, Metro Atlanta. So this was gonna be a tough hit for not just these companies, but for our families as well. That being said, I think the, the, the messaging was clear that when you make decisions, there are consequences. I don't want a boycott of our city. I don't want a boycott of our state. But I think leaders across the state have to understand you don't make decisions in a vacuum. Yeah. And that when you make these decisions in the same way that North Carolina was boycotted and, and many other places have been boycotted when they have made bad policy decisions, that could and did happen to us here. Yeah. So we need to think very carefully yeah. um, about how we are making decisions for the people of this state. Yeah, it feels good to, to snub a corporation when you've been wronged. It feels very bad to see mothers sleeping in cars. Yeah. And 
there is definitely a tie between being able to bring commerce to a state and people getting jobs. So thank you for helping us understand that better because I like baseball, but I like jobs. I like people yeah. being able to support themselves. So I appreciated that. Your mother and father are someone I want to talk about because, again, a lot of time the assumption is when you see articulate, smart, brilliant, competent, competent black children, you assume they've had it easy. Mm -hmm. You think sometimes they're from a free family up north mm -hmm. or, or they had the easy way. You didn't. Your mom's a hairstyle, a cosmetologist, and she fly to this day. I, she just got out of the hospital. She just got an Emory. So, you know, welcome She's back, mom. But good. your mama Thank fly. You. Every time I see her, that gray hair, she swag so I know she was young, man. Woo. I know she was super fly. Your daddy was so clean. Man, you could eat off the floor he stood on. He was clean. Yeah. Man, his, his, he, he was a musician, much like myself. My, um, you know, I had the, the best family ever. Absolutely. And um, just an exciting family, as I would imagine your kids have experienced. And my mother was very free in that. You would come home, your bags would be at the front door. You're like, oh, where are we going? Oh, we're going to England. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, she, because someone, a teacher at Collier Heights, one of um, either my sister or brother's teacher had told her, our better education was to travel than to sit in a classroom. Yeah. So it was extraordinary. And my dad, um, I remember the end of second grade, Kaya Heights used to have what they call sock hops. Mm -hmm. And my mother asked my sister to take me up to the sock hop. Um, the movers were coming. And we were moving. So back then, you didn't really tell the kids, didn't really have a lot of saying anything. And we left my dad at the house and moved all our stuff into an apartment. And I later learned we were the house was about to go into foreclosure. Yeah. Um, so my parents separated. They eventually, as my, my dad had a, a silver tongue. He sent us to Chicago, um, and I came back, and my parents were living together again. Okay. <laughs> so he had to something get his old happened lady, while we were his away. Old lady back. Okay. <laughs> um, and, but because my dad was an entertainer, and when I would come home from school every day, he was home because he worked at night. Mm -hmm. And I uh, came home one day in third grade, and he was in handcuffs, and they were taking him out. And he said, baby, it's, it's going to be okay. I'll be back. And I remember they uh, was officers all over the house, and we had a bunch of boxes because we were packing up to move again. We were moving into another house. And they had torn up all of the boxes, including the box that my toys were in, because yeah. uh, they were looking for drugs. And they told me and my brother and sister we had to stay on the sofa. We couldn't call anybody, couldn't do, couldn't move. And I remember at some point my sister and brother got up, and I stayed there for hours because I thought they would know. And that essentially was the death of our family. So this very privileged life of ballet and traveling and doing all these extraordinary things then became every Saturday and Sunday. I would go to a different prison to visit my dad. Yeah. And it was nothing but other black men yeah. and other black kids around their dad in these prisons. And I think in, in a way it, it did propel me in that I never wanted that to be my life. I never wanted to have to struggle like I saw my mother struggle. I didn't want to run out of gas. I didn't want my water to be turned off. Yeah. I didn't want to have to make a decision to do something like sell drugs because I couldn't eat yeah. that day. So in a lot of ways, it you know, probably was the worst thing that ever happened, aside from losing a loved one, but also that thing that has always driven me. Yeah. Um, and then just what, I mean, my mother just was a really hardworking woman. My grandparents were hardworking. Like, being lazy um, and, and not doing your best what was never an option. Yeah. I appreciate them both for, yeah. for making love and making you. Oh, they, they, thank they, you. They, they did an amazing job. What's next for Keisha Lance? What's next for Keisha Lance Bottoms? What's next for my former mayor? What's next for my forever leader from the west side? What's next for you, and what will you miss about office? Oh, I have 
a lot of options, and I'm grateful for that. Yeah. Um, so you're going to get a, the bag. Huh? You're going to get the bag. <laughs> no, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I honestly don't know. Okay. Uh, I don't know. And that's scary a bit, but I trust God. Yeah. And I trust in the same way he ordered my steps to be mayor. Yeah that it's gonna all work for my good. So, but it is frightening because I've had two jobs since I was 15. Yeah. Um, being mayor is actually the first time I've ever had a single job in my life. I always had multiple jobs. So that's a bit frightening. Um, but I, I am going to miss that I get to make a difference in the lives of people in Atlanta. Yeah. And this term was not as I would have scripted it. I would have never asked for all the things that we faced as a, a country over the past few years. But I do know I was built for it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm thankful that I got to lead our city during this time. I don't even have to ask what would advice would you give a young woman or young man seeking office or what to do next if they simply follow your interviews and understand your story. So I want to thank you duly for being on Love and Respect. I want to thank you for handling me lovingly and respectfully, and I will always do the same with you, and I'll be a supporter of yours always. And I love you. I love thank you. you. Thank you so much.